Final Fantasy VII Remake is a tremendous game. It takes the Midgar portion of the original, fleshes out the world, characters, and takes the presentation of the source material up to 2020 standards. The combat could be confused as an action RPG at a glance, but there is a surprising amount in common with the turn-based games of old. Basic attacks provide great spectacle with action movie-esque swordplay that is wonderfully animated so that most attacks connect giving a tactile feel. However, switching between characters and attacking builds the ATB meters more quickly allowing their casting of magic or use of items and abilities. Being a fan of turn-based combat and having now completed the remake, I cannot imagine a Final Fantasy game going forward without this hybrid style of combat that is far more thoughtful than one would think taking a glance at it. From the management of resources, HP, MP, ATB and limit breaks for each party member, knowing when it is better to block, dodge or cast a spell in case of being interrupted by an enemy, to picking the exact moment to unleash an attack you have been saving your resources for. An example being Tifa's unbridled strength upgrading her base ability to a more powerful attack that is a one-time use until using unbridled strength again. The combat is immensely satisfying to defeat weaker enemies whilst having boss fights that are difficult, tense, and relieving when victorious. The remake does a great job of expanding the characters and world beyond the original at a steady pace allowing the player to grow more attached to each. Moments and characters relegated to being the supporting cast in the original get to be told with greater detail and the characters show more of their personality, allowing the player to become more attached to these ancillary characters. Characters such as Jesse, Biggs and Wedge. Jesse is flirtatious, strong-willed, but will focus on mistakes and blame herself for them, even if not entirely just. Wedge is more carefree, enthusiastic, but has self-esteem issues questioning his worth to Avalanche. Biggs is the calm and collected member of Avalanche to the fiery and hot-headed leader, Barrett. During Chapter 4, with Jesse, Biggs and Wedge, you go to the Shinra Employee Housing District. Early parts of this mission are uneventful, but allow you to spend some time understanding and bonding with these characters, whilst learning the advanced and somewhat yet oppressive nature employees of Shinra are subjected to. Lesser characters in the remake get their time in the limelight. Johnny trying to win over Tifa's heart, or the rookie soldier learning on the job, with the more experienced soldier instructing him to be more intimidating. These moments add brevity and seriously made me chuckle. Even these characters have small arcs as you progress through the chapters. That same shy soldier learning on the job saves many lives by allowing the residents of the Sector 7 slums to escape when Shinra bring down the plate on the slums. Because these characters go through arcs, the world has a sense of being lived in and existed before Cloud came along and you are more attached to the characters as you are actually given more time to know them. As you can tell by now, the remake has so many good qualities that are obvious to anyone who plays the game. But I wanted to highlight some smaller things you may not have noticed that I both liked and disliked with the remake. Final Fantasy VII has one of the most memorable weapons in all of gaming. The notorious and comically large Buster Sword, which, if equipped, is shown prominently on the back of Cloud whilst navigating through the world and during cutscenes. This is the same for all party members. The weapons equipped are always shown during non-combat gameplay and cutscenes, including the materia attached. Seeing the little glowing orbs attached to the weapon, which also match the colour of the materia equipped, is a nice little touch. Of more surprise was the little to no clipping or visual bugginess caused by having the equipped weapons appear in cutscenes. Now, not a bug per se, but when the spike bat is equipped, the sounds when colliding in combat are an awful lot like a blade, and piercing caused by the bat is hardly believable. It will also never not be slightly humorous seeing Cloud just wandering around with a spiked bat. But back on topic. You have likely seen an example in any other game where equipped weapons clip through character models during a cutscene, or the weapon the character or party member has equipped is different to the weapon included in the cutscene. Because of the transitions between cutscene and gameplay being so smooth, having the same weapon equipped appear in both was vital, as to not break the player's perception during these transitions. A more noticeable design choice is no weapon feeling like a must-use upgrade over the rest. Due to how the upgrade system works, each weapon has their own set of core and sub-core upgrades, allowing the player to upgrade how they please. Some weapon upgrades focused on increasing magic power and MP, 
allowing the party members to be more of a mage character, where another weapon could be upgraded making them a damage dealing machine. It all depends on what role you wish them to play. The lighting is amazing! From the streetlights of Midgar, large area lighting of the Mako reactors, the neon sign tinged slums, or the glow of the flames, it all looks realistic. Lighting in a game is a hard thing to get right. Ray tracing to produce realistic lighting is a selling point of the RTX graphics cards and the next generation of consoles. Imagining the amount of time spent just getting the lighting right cannot be understated. When coming out of the apartment in the slums after resting, you are blasted by rays of sunlight, making it hard to see, before slowly the exposure passes, allowing for glimpses of your surroundings. This effect is the exact same experience one would have leaving a dingy, dim room before being met by bright sunlight. This moment and exposure of lighting could easily be taken advantage of, as many will see the detailed character and environmental models, forgetting that the lighting is on point. So much so that players hardly notice just how good it is and likely the sheer amount of time spent getting it right. In any game, linear or open world, developers restrict the player to areas or story beats to only those that should be available to them. This is so players either complete the main missions in a logical order so the story is comprehensible or so they are not battling enemies beyond their capabilities, losing and becoming discouraged. I feel that in recent years, even games that keep players on a strict path have become much better at hiding these rails from the player, giving the illusion that the game is not as restrictive as it actually is. The remake, however, takes a step back in this department. Numerous times I would discover the next progression point right before the game wanted me there to progress. There is no better example of this than during Chapter 6, Light the Way. During this chapter, you have to turn off sun lamps to produce enough power to progress. At the first sun lamp, I went up the ladder to the sun lamp prior to the game instructing me to turn the sun lamp off. Unfortunately, before I could turn the sun lamp off, I needed to go back down the ladder talk to Tifa and Barrett, have them explain the situation to me before heading straight back up the same ladder to switch off the lamp. In other games, I feel occurrences of stagnating progression are handled much better. I should have been able to switch off the sun lamp the first time I went up there, triggering Tifa and Barrett's dialogue. Something simple, acknowledging what I had just done will allow me to progress. You know, the, oh, looks like something has changed, would have sufficed. This would have elicited a different response had this been in an area that couldn't have been accessed without triggering a dialogue from Tifa and Barrett, but it was literally right behind them. This was not the only time small progress was stopped artificially. It happened on many occasions. But not always. For a side quest, I had already collected the item needed to complete the quest. Aerith acknowledged I had the item, allowing me to progress straight away rather than having to re-engage in dialogue with the NPC. The way Final Fantasy VII Remake also restricts the player from accessing places outside of what is allowed for the current mission or outside of the map is archaic. If you attempt to escape the confines of the predetermined scope, the game flashes a big warning message above Cloud's head with some accompanying dialogue from a party member. Where are you going, else you'd rather be? This form of restriction is only slightly better than having a player running into an invisible wall. Final Fantasy VII Remake looks absolutely incredible. So good that transitions between when a player takes control and cutscenes are almost indistinguishable, thanks to the visuals and how the timing between the two sync up. Whilst a lot of attention is paid to what the player has direct influence over, the backgrounds also play their part. Otherwise, they would be noticeable rather than blend in. The remake's backgrounds look so good that when entering a new area, I often pan the camera around to take in the scenery. The backgrounds blend in seamlessly, but also do their part with environmental storytelling and world building. From the slums, you can look up and see the sectors above that look otherworldly. It drives home the difference between the two economic classes. On the plates is a much more technologically advanced city, whilst the slums people are making use of cast off parts from the plate to get by. The residents of the slums feel oppressed, seeing a class that is much better off than them, with seemingly the only way out to devote themselves to Shinra. In Sector 5, there is not a plate due to the construction being incomplete. You can see through to the night sky, giving people hope 
which is in stark contrast when viewing the plate from the other sectors. Finally, just the amount of buildings and detail in the background put into perspective the scale of Midgar. The backgrounds remind me of the older games on PlayStation 1. Due to the limitations of the hardware, pre-rendered backgrounds were used to convey environmental elements and assisted in telling of the story. The backgrounds are not the only small reminders to me of the games that came before. The victory pose when defeating enemies in the VR simulations to Barrett's rendition of the victory theme being two particular standouts. Da, 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 da. 